On the border between Chad and Sudan, at the edge of the Sahara Desert, a remarkable ecological transformation is occurring. Refugees who fled the Sudanese conflict are actively participating in the restoration of degraded lands, using scientifically proven techniques to convert arid soil into productive agricultural systems. This project represents an innovative approach that combines humanitarian response with large-scale environmental restoration. Scientists studying these interventions have documented measurable changes in soil composition, water retention, and agricultural productivity in areas previously considered practically uninhabitable. The context of an environmental and humanitarian challenge. To understand the magnitude of this project, we first need to examine the initial conditions. The Sahel region, the strip of land that separates the Sahara Desert from the more humid savannas to the south, faces significant environmental challenges. Satellite data shows that the Sahara has expanded approximately 10% southward over the last century, with notable acceleration in recent decades. In 2023, the conflict in Sudan generated a massive population displacement. Approximately 600,000 people crossed into Chad, adding to 400,000 refugees from previous conflicts. This means more than 1 million displaced people in a region where resources were already limited. Chad, ranked 190 out of 191 countries in the United Nations Human Development Index, faces its own challenges. It receives irregular precipitation that varies from 200 to 600 mm annually. Temperatures regularly exceed 45 degrees Celsius. Soils are highly degraded, with organic content below 0.5%. However, the Chadian government adopted a pragmatic approach, integrating refugees into its national environmental objectives. The country has committed to restoring 4 million hectares of degraded land by 2030 as part of the continental Great Green Wall of Africa initiative. 100,000 hectares have been specifically allocated for refugee settlements with a focus on productive restoration. The science behind water harvesting half moons the primary method used in this project is based on water harvesting structures known as half moons or demi loons. These are semicircular depressions excavated in the soil with specific dimensions, typically 2 to 4 meters in diameter and 10 to 20 centimeters deep, with a raised edge on the convex side. Dr. Sarah Omondi, a soil conservation specialist from the University of Nairobi, explains the mechanism. She explains that when rain falls on compacted, degraded soil, approximately 60 to 80% of the water flows as surface runoff without infiltrating. Half moons intercept that runoff and allow water to gradually infiltrate. She notes that measurements show a well-constructed half moon can increase water infiltration by 300 to 400% compared to surrounding soil. The process creates several measurable synergistic effects. Organic matter accumulation. Runoff transports soil particles, dead plant material, and other organic components. In normal terrain, these materials are lost. Half moons capture them, creating an organic layer that in Sahel soils typically increases from 0.3% to between 1.8 and 2.5% organic content in two to three years. Microbial activity increases. Soil DNA analyses show that bacterial diversity increases by 250% and fungal biomass increases by 180% within half moons compared to control soil. These microorganisms decompose organic matter, releasing essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Microclimate modification. Measurements with soil thermometers show that temperature at 10 cm depth within half moons is 8 to 12 degrees Celsius lower than surrounding bare soil during peak hours. This thermal reduction decreases evaporation and creates favorable conditions for seed germination. Water availability extension. Measurements with soil moisture sensors demonstrate that half moons retain plant available moisture for three to six additional weeks after rainfall ceases compared to five to seven days in unmodified soil. Dr. Jean-Baptiste Njaffa, a restoration ecologist from the University of N'Djamena, has documented these effects quantitatively. In our study sites, water retention capacity increased from 22 millimeters per meter of soil to 67 millimeters. 
This represents a 204% increase in the soil's capacity to store plant available water. Selection of crops Adapted to the environment The main crops selected for this system are pearl millet and sorghum, both cereals native to Africa that evolve specifically for semi-arid conditions. Millet plays a central role in the design. Dr. Ahmed Osman, an agronomist specializing in Sahel crops, describes the adaptive characteristics. Millet requires only 350 to 500 millimeters of annual precipitation, and it can complete its cycle in 90 to 120 days. It has a root system that penetrates to a depth of 2 to 3 meters, accessing moisture that other crops cannot reach. Additionally, it tolerates soil temperatures up to 35 degrees Celsius during germination. Yield measurements at the 100 hectare site have been documented over two growing seasons. First season, 2023, the average yield was 450 kilograms per hectare of millet compared to zero kilograms in previous years when the land was uncultivated. Second season, 2024, the average yield rose to 680 kilograms per hectare, representing a 51% increase due to cumulative soil improvement. For context, the national average millet yield in Chad is 580 kilograms per hectare, meaning these restored lands are reaching or exceeding the productivity of established agricultural lands. The nutritional content is also significant. Millet contains approximately 11% protein, 5% fat, and is rich in iron, 8 milligrams per 100 grams, magnesium, 114 milligrams, and phosphorus, 285 milligrams. These are micronutrients frequently deficient in diets dependent on food aid. Integrated Long-Term Landscape Design The restoration plan for 100,000 hectares uses a mosaic approach based on agroforestry principles and landscape ecology. Dr. N. Jaffa explains the structure. He says they are not creating a uniform monoculture. They are designing a heterogeneous landscape with multiple functional components. The planned configuration includes the following components. Annual agricultural component, 40% of the area. Half moons with cereal and legume crops that produce food and improve soil through nitrogen fixation. Agroforestry component, 35% of the area. Systems integrating trees with crops, species like Acacia albida, which fixes nitrogen and drops leaves during the rainy season, allowing crops beneath to receive light, and Phydherbia albida, which improves soil and provides fodder. Forest conservation component, 15% of the area. Naturally regenerated forests with native species that stabilize soils, harbor biodiversity, and provide non-timber forest products. Infrastructure and corridors, 10% of the area. Roads, residential areas, and ecological corridors that allow wildlife movement and connectivity between vegetation patches. Projections based on plant growth models suggest that this system will reach the following metrics by 2030. Vegetation cover increasing from current 5% to 65%. Carbon capture of approximately 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent plant biomass production of 180,000 tons annually, aquifer recharge increasing by 25 to 40 percent due to greater infiltration, community collaboration and knowledge transfer. The social aspect of the project is notable for the level of collaboration between local Chadian populations and Sudanese refugees. At a site of 100 hectares, 120 families, Approximately 60% refugees and 40% local Chadians work on adjacent plots using the same techniques. Sociological studies By researchers from the University of N'Djamena found that 73% of local participants reported positive relationships with refugees in communities with joint restoration projects compared to 34% in communities without such projects. Dr. Michael Weber a forced displacement specialist from Georgetown University, analyzes this dynamic. He says when two groups work together to expand the resource base, literally creating new productive capacity where there was degradation before, the dynamic shifts from zero-sum competition to positive-sum collaboration. Both groups benefit from the increase in total system productivity. 
Agricultural technicians provide training in the following areas. Optimal half-moon construction, spacing of 4 to 5 meters, orientation according to topographic contours. Selection of seed varieties adapted to the local climate. Integrated pest management using biological methods. Water conservation techniques and crop management during droughts. Knowledge assessments. Show that after two seasons, 78% of participants can correctly construct half moons according to technical specifications compared to 12% at the program's start. Economic analysis and sustainability. Economists studying the project have calculated its long-term viability. The establishment cost is $850 per hectare, including the following items. Half moon excavation, $280. Seeds and planting material, $120. Tools and equipment, $180. Training and technical assistance, $200. Administrative costs, $70. Projected economic benefits per hectare per year include Cereal production, $340 based on 650 kilograms at $0.52 per kilogram. Non-timber forest products, $85. Livestock fodder, $65. Ecosystem services, $110 for carbon capture and erosion control. Total, $600 annually per hectare. With these numbers, the investment recovery period is approximately 1.4 years, although full benefits materialize after 3 to 5 years when trees mature. Compared to traditional refugee camps that cost $500 to $1,000 per person annually without generating productivity, the economic model demonstrates that each dollar invested in refugee-led restoration generates between $3.2 and $6.8 in total economic benefits. Scientific Monitoring and Measurable Results The project has a robust monitoring system that uses multiple methodologies. Satellite image analysis uses Sentinel-2 images with 10-meter resolution, analyzed every five days to measure changes in the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI. The data show an increase in NDVI from 0.12, indicating bare soil, to 0.48, indicating moderate to dense vegetation in areas with half-moons over two years. Soil sampling is carried out quarterly, with chemical and biological analyses. The results show measurable improvements. Organic content increased from 0.4% to 2.1%. Total nitrogen increased from 0.03% to 0.11%. Cation exchange capacity increased from 4.2 to 12.8 centimoles per kilogram. Earthworm density increased from 2 to 47 individuals per square meter. These changes are scientifically measurable and they document clear improvement in vegetation and soil health. Automatic weather stations, 12 in total, record temperature, humidity, precipitation, and evapotranspiration every hour. Data confirms that restored areas have daily maximum temperatures 3.5 degrees Celsius lower and relative humidity 12% higher than control areas. Biodiversity inventories document the return of species. In 2024, 47 plant species were recorded, compared to 8 in 2022. 23 bird species were recorded, compared to 6, and 12 small mammal species were detected that had not been recorded previously. Dr. Amondi summarizes the findings. The data is unequivocal. We are observing a measurable and rapid ecological transformation, in just two years, we have seen changes that would typically take decades to occur naturally in this environment. Implications for Continental Scale Restoration The Great Green Wall of Africa is a mega-project seeking to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land along 8,000 kilometers from Senegal to Djibouti. As of 2023, approximately 18 million hectares had been restored, 18% of the goal. Chad's approach of integrating refugee settlements with restoration objectives represents a significant opportunity to accelerate progress. With approximately 26 million refugees in Africa, according to UNHCR data, 
If even 20% participated in similar restoration programs, this could add 5.2 million people actively working to green the continent. Refugees could become a major labor force for large-scale restoration. Dr. Najafa calculates that if each participant effectively manages 0.8 hectares, which we have demonstrated is feasible, we are talking about 4.16 million additional hectares under active restoration. That would increase the Great Green Wall's progress rate by approximately 23%. Climate models suggest that restoring vegetation on this scale could have measurable regional effects on precipitation. A study published in Nature Climate Change in 2023 estimated that restoring 20 million hectares in the Sahel could increase local rainfall by 5 to 8% through increased evapotranspiration and atmospheric moisture recycling. Rainfall changes at this scale could alter regional climate dynamics. Globally Applicable Lessons Although this specific project operates in the Sahel, the principles are applicable to other arid and semi-arid regions that host displaced populations. Transferable elements of the model include water harvesting techniques, half moons, work in any environment with 200 to 800 millimeters of annual precipitation, and topography with 0.5 to 5% slope. This includes parts of Australia, the southwestern United States, northern Mexico, Central Asia, and northern Africa. Integration of environmental and humanitarian objectives. Many refugee-receiving countries also have forest restoration commitments under agreements like the Bonn Challenge, which has a goal of 350 million hectares by 2030. Strategic integration can advance both objectives simultaneously. Livelihood approach. Transforming refugees from passive aid recipients to active participants in ecological restoration has been successfully implemented in Uganda with Congolese refugees in reforestation, in Jordan with Syrian refugees in greenhouse agriculture, and in Bangladesh with Rohingya refugees in coastal dune stabilization. Dr. Weber cautions that we cannot simply replicate the Chadian model mechanically everywhere. Each region requires careful analysis of climate, soils, hydrology, native plant species, and local sociocultural contexts. But the fundamental principles, empowering displaced populations as agents of environmental restoration, are universally valuable. A scientifically documented transformation. This project in Chad represents more than an innovative humanitarian response. It is a large-scale scientific experiment in degraded ecosystem restoration using low-cost techniques and available labor. Data collected during the first two years demonstrates measurable and significant changes in key indicators. Soil composition, water availability, agricultural productivity, and biodiversity. The initial 100 hectares have produced over 68 tons of cereals in two seasons, directly feeding approximately 850 people. The planned expansion to 100,000 hectares, if successful, could annually produce 65,000 tons of cereals and capture 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide while providing livelihoods for more than 100,000 people. This story illustrates a fundamental principle. Even in environments considered marginal or degraded, the careful application of ecological knowledge combined with organized human effort can generate remarkable transformations. The desert is greening not through costly technological interventions, but through the systematic application of proven techniques by motivated communities. Scientists will continue monitoring this natural experiment to refine techniques, quantify long-term benefits, and document emerging challenges. The results will inform restoration efforts throughout the Sahel region and beyond, offering empirical evidence of what is possible when human needs align with ecological restoration objectives.